The Spatial OS GDK for Unity is made up of multiple parts, a core module, and several feature modules. Feature modules are solutions for difficult or common networking problems in game development, like synchronizing positions and spawning game objects across multiple clients. In this video, I'm going to show you how to leverage these feature modules so you can get the most out of the Spatial OS GDK for Unity. My name is Charles, and this is Infallible Code, a channel designed to help you become a better game developer. If you'd like to learn more about Unity, programming, and game development, then be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you'll be notified whenever a new video is made available. Head on over to the Feature Modules section of the documentation for the Spatial OS GDK for Unity. I'll leave a link to that in the description. If we scroll down, we can see that there are a number of feature modules at our disposal. We're just going to focus on the game object creation feature module for this video. But don't worry, because the process for using these is very similar across the board. You simply add the package to your project, reference the assembly, and then call the required API code. Why don't we dive right in by getting acquainted with the example project. If you've been following this series, then you should already be familiar with the Blank Starter project. This is a Spatial OS project that contains the minimum GDK feature set required to start developing Spatial OS games in Unity. Along with the core module, the Blank Starter project already leverages a couple of feature modules right out of the box. One in particular is the Player Lifecycle module, which is responsible for managing entities that represent connected players. Let's run the project so we can see it in action. We'll begin by starting up a local instance of a Spatial OS server. Expand the Spatial OS menu in the top navbar and click on Local Launch. You can also use the Ctrl L shortcut on Windows or Command L on Mac. Once it's started, run the development scene to connect both the client and game logic workers to the local server. You'll know it worked if the console reports that both workers were created successfully. Beautiful. Now at this point, the player lifecycle module should have spawned a new entity to represent the client that just connected. Let's confirm this using the Spatial OS Inspector. Expand the Spatial OS menu in the nav bar and click on Open Inspector. You can also navigate to the inspector manually using the URL that appears in the command line when you launch a local instance of Spatial OS. Once you're in the inspector, zoom in and check out the list of entities on the right hand side of the screen. You should see one for the player. There it is. Great. The player lifecycle feature module is working as expected. But unfortunately, we can't see this entity in the scene because it doesn't have a game object to represent it. That's where the game object creation feature module comes in. The Game Object Creation Feature Module is responsible for managing game objects that represent Spatial OS entities. To enable it, all we need to do is install the package and modify our workers to make the correct API calls. Once it's set up, it'll begin spawning game objects using a default implementation that keys off of each entity's metadata value. But more on that in a moment. Let's switch back to Unity and get this installed first. If you're using the Blank Starter project, then this package should already be installed. We can confirm this using the Package Manager. Expand the Window menu in the top navbar and click on Package Manager. I'll dock mine right here next to the Game and Scene views. Next, select All Packages and search for Game Object Creation, and then verify that the package has been installed. If it doesn't show up, you'll need to add a reference to the package in your project's manifest file. The Blank Starter project uses a relative path in its manifest file that references the package directly from a local copy of the GDK for Unity. Either way, once it's installed, we'll need to add a reference to the package in our project's assembly definition file. Now, you only need to do this step if your project has one, and the Blank Starter project does, so if you're following along, let's go ahead and do that now. First, open up the assembly definition file in the inspector. Then add the package to the assembly definition references by clicking on the plus sign and then searching for game object creation. Finally, scroll down and click apply. Beautiful. Now we can switch to the code editor and add the API calls. We're going to enable this module on both the server and client workers so that entities can have a game object representation on both sides. In the Blank Starter project, the client worker is represented by the Unity Client Connector class, and the server worker by the Unity Game Logic Connector class. Why don't we start with the client? Open up the Unity Client Logic Connector class and take a look at the Handle Worker Connection Established method. This method gets called when the worker connects to the Spatial OS server, so it's a great place to configure our feature modules. In fact, we can see that that's exactly where the Player Lifecycle feature module gets enabled. 
let's add a call right underneath it to game object creation helper dot enable standard game object creation and pass in a reference to the workers world. This call will configure the ECS systems that are required in order for this module to work. And for the server, switch over to the Unity Game Logic connector and add the same call to the same method. Awesome. And that's it for the code. Now, it's important to note that the Game Object Creation feature module uses a default implementation to create game objects. We can override this behavior if we want by creating a class that implements iEntityGameObjectCreator and passing it into the calls to enable standard game object creation. But the default implementation works just fine for our needs right now. Basically, it locates each entity's prefab using a specific convention. It searches for a prefab that's name matches the entity's metadata value. That prefab must be located within the resources folder, nested underneath a folder called prefabs, and then another folder that's either called common or named after the connector that corresponds with the instance of that entity. It'll make more sense once I show you. But first, if you're using the blank starter project, then you should find the logic that's responsible for creating the player entity right here in the Unity Game Logic Connector class. The method called create player entity template is responsible for, you guessed it, creating the player entity. And we can see that it sets the player entity's metadata value to player. So the default implementation would expect to find a prefab called player in the resources slash prefab slash common folder or in the resources slash prefabs slash unity client for unity client workers and resources slash prefabs slash unity game logic folder for server workers. If you're using the blank starter project, that's a lot to digest. So why don't we switch back to unity and see it in action? Let's create a prefab for the player entity using the convention that I just described. First, create a folder called prefabs inside of the resources directory. Then add two more folders, one called Unity Client and the other called Unity Game Logic. Again, these are named after the workers that already exist in the Blank Starter project. Next, let's create a prefab for the player. Create a capsule in the scene and rename it to player. Then drag the player game object into each of the folders that we just created. Unity's asking me if I want to create a new original prefab or make this a variant. I'll select original prefab so I can edit them separately later on. Lastly, delete the player game object from the scene. Perfect, we're all set up. Let's test this out by starting up our project one more time. First, hit Control L on Windows or Command L on Mac to start a local instance of Spatial OS. Then, once it's started, run the development scene. Check it out. We should have two player game objects in the scene. And if we take a look at the hierarchy, we should see that one of them belongs to the Unity client worker and the other belongs to the Unity game logic worker. That's because the development scene contains both workers, but in production, each client will only have one worker and therefore only one game object to represent each player. We can test this even further by adding another client to the server. To do this, we'll need to build our Unity client worker to run locally. First, stop the development scene and the server. And then expand the spatial OS menu, mouse over build for local, and then click Unity Client. And then wait for the client to finish building. Once it's done, start up the Spatial OS server using Control L or Command L, and then rerun the development scene. Lastly, expand the Spatial OS menu one more time and click on Launch Standalone Client. This will launch, again, you guessed it, a standalone client that we can connect to the server. And once it does, we'll see two more players get added to the development scene. Beautiful. And that's all there is to it. In the next video, we'll jump right into player movement and add some custom logic to the game object creation feature module. You won't want to miss it. If you enjoy this video, then please leave a like and a comment letting me know what you thought. Thank you for watching. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Special shout out to Trond, Loot Pigeon, Dark Rush Photography, Justin Hurst, NZ, Sean Carey, Thomas, and Wayne Glows.